Roger, Roger, 5905. A correction, Whiskey 4, Echo, Echo, Yankee. All right, so let's get started with uh, chapter three, everybody's favorite regulatory uh, rules and <laughs> regulations. Um, what book is that? Over here, Rod. You can have a seat, I'll bring it to you. All right, so let's get started on uh, chapter three. Um, and for regulatory agencies, the, the global agency for civilian telecommunications is the International Telecommunications Union, uh, the ITU. Uh, they're located in Switzerland, uh, and they have a website. Uh, so if you wanted to get some more information about them, uh, you can find it uh, online. In the United States, it's the uh, Federal Candy Company. No, I mean the uh, Federal Communications Commission, uh, who are the uh, head agency for civilian rules and regulations. Uh, and uh, they also have a website your primary involvement with the FCC and their website will probably be through the Universal Licensing System, or ULS portion of the website. That's where you can renew your license, you can make uh, call sign applications for a new vanity call sign, uh, you can update your address, all online at the Universal Licensing System, and it's all for free. So. Um, when your license comes up for renewal, you'll get things in the mail saying, hey, we'll renew your license for $20. Well, okay, they could do it, but you can do it for free. So you don't need to. The FCC has rules for all of the services that they administer, whether it be broadcasting, whether it be business band, commercial radio, and amateur radio service they uh, have a section of the FCC rules, that's section 97, or part 97. And the easiest place to find these is actually at the American Radio Relay League, uh, the link uh, that we have here. Uh, you can get it directly from the FCC, but it's easier if you go to the ARRL. They'll have the latest copy, the latest version, the latest information uh, as a PDF or in other formats as well. So we talked about the, the overseeing administrative bodies, the governmental bodies. Now we're going to talk about um, the organizations of amateur radio operators themselves. And there's a corresponding world organization. It's the International Amateur Radio Union, or the IARU. And member bodies of the IARU are like the German Amateur Radio Club or the Radio Society of Great Britain, or here in America we have uh, the American Radio Relay League. So the IARU has a website as well with additional information. You can go take a look. And then here we are to ARRL, the American Radio Relay League, which got its start in the 20s uh, when the average station couldn't transmit a signal more than 20 miles. And so messages that were going to be sent had to be relayed from one station to another. Hence, American Radio Relay League. That's how the name comes about. And the website. So who enforces these regulations that we've been talking about? You know, the FCC, the Part 97. In days gone by, it used to be the FCC themselves. They would send inspectors out and, and actually write violations. Not so anymore because of budget and, and resource limitations. Um, we volunteer our, uh, to uh, enforce the rules ourselves. Now through a, a group called the Volunteer Monitors. I like to call them the band police. But uh, uh, this is actually new in the last year. It used to be a group called the Official Observers. And now the OOs are being phased out and the voluntary monitors uh, are being uh, put in their place. You must be formally registered um, as a volunteer monitor with the ARRL. There will be 250 of them 
nationwide with at least five in each ARRL section. Um, they're going to receive, if they haven't already, mandatory training. Uh, and they will issue notices to amateurs that will be sent out via ARRL headquarters. So if they're tuning the bands and they notice an error, you're operating out of band uh, or a mode that's not authorized for your license, uh, they will write it up, send it via ARRL headquarters to you at your registered mailing address and say, oops, don't do this again. It's coordinated by the ARRL and it's designed to foster a wider knowledge and better compliance with the rules. Um, Self-regulation, uh, if, if we can do it, uh, that's good for us because we then don't have to involve uh, an official government agency. Um, and um, it enables the Enforcement Bureau of the FCC to go on to bigger fish. So it's a win-win situation if, if we can keep it. Anybody know what that device is on the top there of the photo? That is a radio direction finding apparatus. Uh, and um, you actually, if you look at police cars nowadays, you'll see something similar uh, on the tops of police cars. And, and those are actually designed primarily for a commercial service called LoJack, and there may be some others, uh, which in very expensive cars, like if you've got a Maserati, They'll put a low jack system in there, and if the car is stolen, it'll start screaming on a radio frequency, I'm stolen, I'm stolen. And with the radio direction finding systems uh, in police cars, they can find the low jack. Well, same thing can happen with amateur radio. Uh, if you've got a you know, wayward uh, child that's uh, broadcasting uh, you know, things that we don't, you know, we're not supposed to be doing, radio direction finding systems uh, can help uh, the volunteer monitors find them uh, and identify who they are. Um, so RDF systems are also used in fox hunts uh, when uh, people put out hidden transmitters and the, the whole purpose of the game is, is to find the transmitter. So FAA, I'm not flying a plane. What the heck is the FAA doing in this presentation? Well, has to do um, with um, this is their website, by the way, and we're not going to be weaponized. Uh, that's just how it came out. But um, tower heights. Something new this year, and I'm not even fully clear on the regulations, and it's not part of the test. It used to be that any tower up to 200 feet, you didn't have to worry about lighting, you didn't have to worry about painting, uh, and, and you were cool. Well, now there's a revision, and you may now have to paint them. Uh, with obstruction paint, or you may have to light them with strobes. Um, that's still being fleshed out. But generally, for the test, the answer is 200 feet, as long as you're more than four miles away from a public airport. If you're within four miles of a public airport, then you probably should contact uh, the flight service at the airport uh, and, and you know, ask them if they have guidance. If not, you might have to go to the FAA. But you want to make sure this is all about public safety. You want to make sure that, um, that you know, transportation uh, is safe, uh, not going to cause an accident because of an uncoordinated tower, a tower that nobody knows about. Additional tower restrictions. There's one that you can do something about and one right now that you can't. Uh, if you're in a homeowner's association, uh, you may have restrictive covenants. Uh, and the worst one for hams is the one that says no towers, no antennas. Um, so uh, that there is no relief at the present time. The ARRL is working with the FCC to try to get relief from restrictive HOA covenants. But it's not happened yet. However, there are also sometimes restrictions in local government ordinances and zoning. And there you do get some help with FCC rule PRB-1. And the whole point of this rule, uh, that it provides guidance to uh, city and county governments that zoning restrictions must reasonably accommodate amateur radio installations. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to get everything you want. But if the convention um, 
is that if you want to be operating on 20 meters and you want to put up a tri-bander, the reasonable height for that to operate as designed is probably about 50 to 60 feet. So you're not going to walk in and say, I want a 100-foot tower and get it necessarily. But if you walk in and be reasonable and say that to work as designed, I need to have a tower 50 to 60 feet, they will probably work with you. You may have to have an attorney. You know, you never know. But PRB1 is on your side from the FCC. So back to the ITU, the uh, International Governing Body of Civilian Radio Communications. The ITU has divided the world up into three zones. And since they're in Europe, Europe is in zone one. And then you follow the sun around the world. So we, in North America, South America, Central America, we are in zone two. And then zone three is the Pacific region uh, and uh, Asia. So zones one, Europe, two, North America, three, Asia. And the reason I point this out, on some bands, 160 meters, 80 meters, and 40 meters, the amateur radio frequency allocations are different. Uh, and this sometimes makes for interesting communications internationally. 40, 60, and 80, did you say? 160 meters, 80 meters, and 40 meters. Uh, and you'll get this presentation as a PDF, so you can see specifically. Um, but in, in some countries, uh, like in Europe, they have phone privileges down where we only have Morse code privileges. Uh, and they can't transmit up where we can transmit. So sometimes on 40 meters you'll find, and especially in contests, you'll find stations operating high in the 40 meter band in the American allocation saying listening down on a CW frequency for us and Europeans can come back to you there. So that's a really wide split uh, where you're, you're operating very high in the band and the Europeans are operating very low in the band. And the reason they're doing that are because of these ITU region uh, oh, So they are listening for us. Up high in the band. And then they'll transmit back. Low in the band where we yeah. will listen. Oh, okay. So, um, and actually we have the widest frequency allocations in these bands, but they're just different in, in some other countries. So just be aware on um, these three bands, these regional differences do exist. And if you travel, and are going to you know, then operate in ITU Region 2, you must, or ITU Region 1, you must abide, abide by the ITU Region 1 restrictions. And there are some special exceptions for uh, entities which are under FCC control, Alaska and Hawaii, for example. They can operate on frequency uh, ranges that we can't operate on here in the, in the 48 uh, contigu contiguous states. Um, there's fine print, and there's a lot of detail here. What you need to know on the bottom line, some FCC regulated amateur stations, like in Guam, or Marianas Islands, or Hawaii, or Alaska, can operate on frequencies that are different than those used by amateur stations here on the continent. Just be aware of that. So we're, if you're going to talk to them on those bands, it's the same deal where you're going to listen. You, you may have to. Yes, that's, yeah. that's possible. That's possible. Yeah. So let's uh, look at some questions. So which of the following may apply in areas under FCC jurisdiction outside of ITU Region 2? D is in dog, the frequency allocations may be different. That's what we just got done saying. That, um, uh, so in Guam or Marianas, their frequency allocations may be different than here. And what is the maximum height above ground to which an antenna structure may be erected without requiring notification to the FAA? 200 feet, that's the current rule, uh, but there are some changes coming up. So if you're gonna build a 200 foot tower, uh, I would look into it to find out what the actual requirements are right now. For the test, 200 feet. Are you going to say you build a 200 foot one and they change the rules on it? Are you going to have to go change yes. by put? Yes. And stuff? Yes, because it has to do with public safety. Yeah. 
So under what conditions are state and local governments permitted to regulate amateur radio antenna structures? Look for that two-word phrase. Amateurs must be reasonably accommodated uh, in their antenna installations under PRB1. So the frequency allocations of which ITU region apply to radio amateurs operating in North and South America? We are region number two, correct. And what is the volunteer monitoring program? The thing to remember about this is that you can't designate yourself as a, as a volunteer monitor. Hey. You must be formally enlisted in the ARRL program. No band police badges for you. Which of the following are objectives of the volunteer monitoring program? B. Did I hear B as in boy? That's correct, yeah. And what skills learned during hidden transmitter hunts are of help to the volunteer monitoring program? That direction finding apparatus that I showed you, that's the thing that we want you to remember. All right, onto the second section. There are four sections tonight. So we'll go through two sections, we'll take a break, and then we'll go through the, the last two. Amateur licensing rules. So back in the day, back when it all started, the FCC used to license amateur radio operators directly. Um, there were two exceptions for the novice license, which no longer exists. Uh, there you could have a, an application or a, a test mailed out uh, to a licensed ham who would give the test. Um, and then if you wanted to upgrade to the general class, but you were too far away from an FCC office, uh, then you could take that test by mail and you got what, is, what was known as a conditional license. Those two things don't go on anymore. But uh, in my case, I'm from Michigan, so this was the Detroit field office, uh, the doors to it anyway. It closed in 2017. Uh, but this is kind of what it looked like. Uh, I was there actually uh, in the uh, 70s. Uh, and it was one of these old office -y type of things. And you'll hear the old timers talk about stories of when they took their tests there and how gruff the inspectors were and whatnot. It was, it was a trip. Well, that all changed in 1984. And for us, I think changed for the better uh, in that there was the uh, National uh, Commission on Volunteer Examiner Coordinators. And there are 14 organizations that give amateur radio license exams. Um, and here, the Red Cross, uh, it's the West Carolina Amateur Radio Service, the very last one on this list. The other two big ones are the American Radio Relay League. That's, they're a volunteer examiner coordinator. Uh, and the W5YI organization. Uh, so, those are the big ones. There are some other smaller ones as well. Here's the point. A VEC, or Volunteer Examiner Coordinator, is an organization. ARRL, W5YI, West Carolina Amateur Radio Service, those are VECs. A VE, a Volunteer Examiner, is a person. So keep that in mind, that a VEC is an organization, a VE, is a person. And volunteer examiners, a person, they're a, they receive accreditation from an organization, the VEC. Uh, volunteer examiners must have a license class above the grade being tested, although extras still test extras. So you can't you know, get around that. Um, there must be three volunteer examiners present during testing. Um, and must be 18 years old or older. So these are the, the rules for volunteer examiners. 
So the question is, can a non-US citizen be a volunteer examiner? Can my friend Matt and you 4 e who has an amateur extra class license in the United States, could he be a volunteer examiner? And the answer is yes. He's over 18 years old, and if he re received accreditation from West Carolina Amateur Radio Service or ARRL or W5YI, then yes indeed, even though he's not an American citizen, he could be a volunteer examiner. Now this gets interesting because I've been to the uh, ham radio uh, ham fest in Germany, uh, in Friedrichshafen, Germany, uh, and uh, it's the biggest ham fest in Europe. It, it's fantastic. And when I went there, there are people lined up to take the American exam. What? Uh, come to find out, the American exam is easier than the German exam. And in Germany, as long as you, know, you, you have a mailing address in the United States, which Germans get readily from friends or whatever else, then they can take the American exam, and if they pass the American exam, if they get, for example, the extra class license, then they can receive a German call sign from their own Bundesnetz um, based on the fact that they have a foreign call sign. It's a loophole in the system. So foreign nationals can, in fact, be volunteer examiners, and you'll see them at work in Friedrichshafen. That's fairly recent, by the way. Yep. So when you pass your test, uh, when you pass your general, and you will, you'll be given a receipt. But it won't really look like this. It'll look more like this. And it's called the Certificate of Successful Completion of Exam. This had more force back in the days of Morse code, where sometimes people would pass the Morse code exam, but not pass the written exam, or vice versa. They'd pass the written and not the code. Well, then they had up to a year to pass the other requirement and get credit for the test that they took. So that's where this, this comes from. The, the receipt is good for one year. At the moment, right now, it's just a, a proof that you actually passed the test. Um, but it doesn't really buy you anything special. Anybody with an expired amateur radio license that was not revoked, it was expired but not revoked, um, if you can demonstrate that you had the general or you had the advanced or you had the extra class, even by if you, there were old amateur radio call books, you can, if you can show somebody that, you know, hey, that's me right there, and you can prove that you used to live at that address, you can get your old license back simply by taking the technician test, element two. So that's kind of nice. You won't necessarily get your old call sign back, however. You'll likely get a new call sign issued by the FCC. When you pass your general test, you are immediately a general class operator. You don't have to wait for any paperwork to come from the FCC. And you can go on the air on the general class portion of the bands. But what you have to do is use your technician license and then say stroke AG or slant AG. AG stands, I think, for acting general. You've passed. You can do it. And you only have to do that in the general class portion of the bands. If you, don't, if you want to get on the two meter repeater, you can still use your technician call sign, unless you want to brag, unless you want to let people know that you passed your test. That's possible. All right, you're going to talk to your friend in Germany, and you're going to have the QSO in German, but you're an American ham with an American call sign. How do you have to do your identifications? Identifications must all, always be done in English. Oh, more questions. This is going to be a shorter night than Dave's. So who may receive partial credit for the elements represented by an expired amateur radio license? Who can receive partial credit? Any person who can demonstrate that they once held an FCC-issued general, advanced, or extra class license that was not revoked. And they can get their license 
back at that class just by taking the technician test. And what license examinations may you administer when you are an accredited VE, okay, and you have a general class operator license? Technician only, correct. And on which of the following band segments may you operate if you are a technician class operator and have that receipt? On any general or technician class band segment. You are a general once you have that piece of paper. But you will have to use your call sign KN4ABC stroke AG. So which of the following is a requirement for administering a technician class license exam? You've got to have VEs that are general or above, and you've got to have at least three of them. And how old do they have to be? 18. 18, okay. Which of the following must a person have before they can be an administering VE for a technician class license exam? You gotta have two things. You gotta have a license class, at least one license class above, so it'd be a general class, and you must be accredited from a VEC. So D is correct. And when must you add the special identifier AG after your call sign? Whenever you're operating in the general class portion of the bands, and we'll take a closer look at that here in a sec. Um, then you have to use the stroke AG. So volunteer examiners are accredited by what organization? A? F A? No. C. C. Volunteer examiners are people. VECs are the organizations. And which of the following criteria must be met for, non -US citizen, for a non-U.S. citizen to be an accredited volunteer examiner? They're not yet accredited, but to be accredited, what must they have also? A general class license or above. And how long is the receipt, the Certificate of Successful Completion of your exam, valid? 365 days. Normally, West Cars, when you take your test on Saturday, you have your notification on Monday right now. So 365 days is way too long in the current system. But back in the day, it made more sense. So what is the minimum age? to be a volunteer examiner, 18. And what is required to obtain a new general class license after a previously held license has expired and the two year grace period has passed? If you had a license but it's expired, was not revoked, what you have to do is take element two again, the technician class exam. All right, let's take five minutes. You're doing great. This is kind of a dry subject, <laughs> rules and regulations. So uh, we'll try to get through it and give you the information you need to know. Um, next section is control operator privileges. Every radio transmitter has to have a control operator. So every amateur radio station has someone who is responsible for controlling that station. And it is assumed to be the station licensee. When you get your license, you actually get two licenses in one. You get a station license, a license so that you can build a station at a particular location, and you get an operator's license. And so um, th there are actually two parts of the license that isn't immediately obvious. 
So you got your new frequency charts. I call them the, the color charts. And on the back, by the way, if you look at the back as a, a map of the United States, with all of the section numbers. So we are in the four section. So amateur radio call signs, when they're issued for this section, are issued with a number four in them. Where I came from in Michigan, that's eight land. So uh, ham radio call signs in Michigan are always issued with a number eight. So that is a general rule. If you hear somebody on the air and they've got a, a five in their call sign, well, they're probably out in Texas or Oklahoma. But it's no longer guaranteed. It used to be if you moved to a region, you had to change your call sign. And you had to get one with that region number. Well, the FCC did away with that. So now you will hear people in this region with two call signs, W2SGT, for example. Um, or when I first came here, I was Whiskey 8, Echo Echo Yankee. But I decided I'm going to stay here. I'm not going back to 8 land, so I wanted a four call sign. Um, and our friend Bob uh, up in Hendersonville, ND7J. When he calls somebody, people start moving their antennas toward Oregon. Wrong. No, he's in Hendersonville. So anyway. So this chart, it's available from the ARRL as a paper chart like you have here. And I highly recommend that you take this to Staples or to Office uh, Depot and have them laminate it. And then you can have it right at your operating desk. And this is something you will consult all the time. Um, I still do frequently. Oh, I do too. Yeah, so everybody does. Um, if you notice that um, each of the bands is indicated by the approximate wavelength of the signals in that band. Um, so uh, in the, the top of the center, for example, is the 40 meter band. And you see that the frequencies there are 7 megahertz frequencies. So 40 meters, 7 megahertz. And as you go through your ham radio career, it'll become second nature. You'll, you'll just know, oh, 20 meters, that's 14 megahertz. 10 meters, 28 megahertz. But if you need to, you know, remember, what band is that? This was the frequency um, uh, formula that Dave talked about last week with the 300 and either divide it by the frequency in megahertz or divide it by the band, and you can go back and forth. So when you get your general class license, you will have full privileges on 160 meters, 60 meters, 30 meters, 70 meters, 12 meters, and 10 meters. Six bands, all of the World Administrative Radio Conference bands, uh, which actually were new back in the 90s, I think. Um, but on the old timers bands, you're still going to have some restrictions. Now, what are the old timers bands? Well, 80, 40, 20, and 15. And so let's take a look at uh, 20 meters, which is right in the middle of the chart there. And if you notice over on the right hand side of 20 meters, there are the letters E, A, and G. E stands for extra class, A stands for advanced class, and G stands for general class. So when you get your general class license, you are restricted to the smaller portion that is indicated by the, the green for the phone portion or the red for the CW portion. Gary, there aren't any advanced class licenses being issued anymore. Why do they still have advanced class? Because there still are advanced class operators out there. They can still renew their license every 10 years. They don't have to upgrade if they don't want to. So that's why you still see the advanced class here. All right, let's, let's change. Let's go up one to the 40 meter band. And if you look on the right, you'll see the E, A, G. But now there's something else there. There's N and T. See at the bottom? And the N and T 
actually if you move over, it goes all the way over to the CW portion of the band where that black and white squiggly line is. And what that is indicating is that for people who hold novice or technician class licenses, you can operate Morse code in that frequency range. Right now with your technician license, you can operate HF Morse code in that frequency range with a power limitation of 200 watts. Well, Gary, they're not issuing any novice licenses anymore. Again, the novice license was made renewable. There are people who hold novice licenses today um, and they can renew them every 10 years and so this is still in effect. So for 80, 40, 20, and 15, you don't have full privileges. And that's how the FCC has organized it to incentivize you to upgrade. In the United States, we get additional frequencies when we upgrade. In some countries, like in Great Britain, you get additional power. They get all of the frequencies to start, but they have limitations on power. Um, so. I don't know which is better, but that's how we do it. So keep in mind that the old timers bands, see all the old timers there, um, these are the ones that have some limited privileges for generals. So if you look on your chart, and if you look over at the key on the right hand side, you'll see that red refers to radio teletype, that's RTTY, and data. So you, can you find a band that is only red? And that would be 30 meters or 10 megahertz. So 30 meters is a data only band. You can operate radio teletype or data modes. This is something Dave mentioned last week, but I would just want to reemphasize that slow scan TV, which is just made up of audio tones that are actually plugged in to the microphone input on, a, on an HF transceiver, um, is considered a voice mode. So uh, you have to have voice privileges on a band before you can transmit slow scan TV. So slow scan TV would not be appropriate for 30 meters because it's not a data mode, it's a voice mode. CW, what about that? CW is, is completely different. CW is allowed pretty much on all bands, on all frequencies, even in the phone portion. Of, of the CW is always allowed. So the question I have is on 30 meters, can you send slow scan TV? It's a data band only. There's no provision for voice, so you can't send slow scan TV. Anybody recognize one of these boxes? Yeah. The chicken band, citizens band radios. 11 meter band. The 11 meter band, I'll have you know, used to be an amateur radio band in the 1950s, and they had to give it up for this new service, Citizens Band. There are still old, old hams who are bitter about that. <laughs> the big difference between CB radios and ham radios is what I call the big knob. CBs are channelized, 40 channels, you click, 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 and you're on that. Whereas we have the big knob, we can continuously tune to pretty much any frequency within the band with an exception. Shades of CB radio, if you look at the 60 meter band, which is in the lower left hand corner, you see the blue there, there are certain channels designated for use in this band. You can't continuously tune the band. You must be within these channels. You must have a signal that is no wider than 2.8 kilohertz. Um, so this is the only band where this restriction applies. Yeah. Do you buy a separate radio for that? Or no, you, you just tune your radio very carefully. Okay, it's not preset in the radios? It, some radios do have memory channels preset for these particular things. And that's a good idea that you can program memory channels so that you just are immediately right in the where you should be. So besides being channelized, 60 meters is restricted uh, in power to 100 watts 
peak envelope power as applied to a dipole antenna. And that's all in the fine print down here on the chart. So if you have a dipole antenna up for 60 meters, you can go to 100 watts peak envelope power. Now, if you put up an, a gain antenna for this band, let, let's say the antenna has 3 dB of gain, 3 dB is twice, you have to reduce your power from 100 watts down to 50 watts. Everybody plays at the same power level on this band. And if we don't do that, if you come along and say, well, I'm just going to use my linear amplifier. Uh, Dave Sumner, former president of the ARRL, said for 60 meters, if we abuse it, we will lose it. So just be aware that you need to operate with those restrictions. So what's so special about 60? Nothing. <laughs> it just, it's in, in totally this time, different than all the others. It, it, it's a shared band. There are other things going on in that area. So to avoid interference to other services, that's why we have to stay in the channel. And you can follow this link. It'll tell you more in, information uh, about 60 meters and, and, and why it is that way. So we, we looked uh, at uh, 40 meters and 20 meters. Here's 80 meters. Again, if you look off on the side, the E, A, G, and the N and T, we know what that means now. N and T's are restricted to 200 watts. Um, but when you get your general class uh, license, what's the maximum power level that you can run on 80 meters? 1,500 watts. That's the peak envelope power. That's the legal limit for hams. And so that applies here. 40 meters. There are some special rules having to do with Guam and the Marianas Islands and Hawaii, and that's in the fine print below 40 meters. We already talked about that. They're in a different ITU region, so they have some different characteristics. And then 20 meters, we looked at that E, A, and G. Notice, no novice or technician privileges on 20 meters. 20 meters you only get when you get a general class license. So 10 meters, a special case, at the very top end, tippy top end of the 10 meter band from 29.5 megahertz up, you can have FM repeaters. Just like we have on you know, Caesar's Head Mountain, a two meter repeater, but you can have a 10 meter repeater. Uh, and why? Well, it's kind of fun to be driving around when there are sunspots. You can check into the New York City 10 meter repeater from here. So it's kind of wild. It kind of gets interesting. Um, I point out that the repeaters are, are built just like we, we saw before with the, the radio repeater rack and the uh, filters, the cavity filters, except for 10 meters. Notice on the right there, that cavity filter is taller than you know, a person. So, and you have to have a series of those. Uh, so it gets a little hairy if you're going to have a 10 meter repeater, but it is possible. So some amateur radio bands like 60 meters um, and 30 meters, we are secondary users on the bands. Um, we share the bands uh, and we must protect the primary users, which may be military, may be commercial. Um, and also we cannot communicate with the primary users. So if you hear them on the band, you can't yell at them. <laughs> Uh, so we have to protect the, the primary users on a band. How do you know? 30 meters and 60 meters. And if you are interfered with by a primary user, I say you have to suck it up. And QSY, what does QSY mean? Change frequency. So you, you have to move off that frequency or maybe even to a different band. Primary users have uh, that right. All right, on a completely different subject, dealing with propagation, radio propagation, there are stations set up around the world that are called beacon stations. Uh, and they send in Morse code at particular times of the day, at particular power levels. And if you know when they're going to be on, you can listen for them. 
And if you can hear the beacon stations, then you have an idea, hey, propagation is open to that particular area. And as I say, it's divided uh, you know, by, by the clock. Uh, and here's somebody who's marked up a clock as to when certain stations are going to be on the air. Uh, they're all around the world. There are two in the United States. One at the United Nations building in New York City. So it actually has a uh, four uh, call uh, sign. Uh, I can't remember the four U one U N. I think it is. Um, and there's one with was given special authorization by the FCC in San Francisco. That's operated by the Northern California DX Foundation, and they're the ones that coordinate the worldwide beacons. We had so, one on Midway for years. Right. And so you may look in the MFJ equipment catalog and see this, and it talks about a beacon monitor. When I first saw this, I thought it was a radio. It's not a radio. It's a clock. And what happens is when a beacon station is supposed to be on the air, the clock will light a little LED and tell you and you, you adjust a dial for which band you're interested in, so 20 meters and whatnot, it'll tell you which beacon is transmitting on the frequency at that time, um, and they'll transmit at 100 watts, 10 watts, and then one watt. So you can see how, how well it is. You don't have to buy the clock from MFJ, though, if you've got a smartphone. There's an app for that. The Northern Cal uh, Car California DX Foundation has an app that does the same thing that'll light up uh, when a particular beacon is supposed to be on the air. So can you have your own beacon station? Well, not without special FCC authorization, except on 10 meters. You can actually, without any special authorization, put your own 10 meter beacon on the air in the spectrum space between 28.2 and 28.3, you may use automatic control, uh, and you're limited, as with the others, to 100 watts. And uh, other amateurs can listen for your beacons, uh, can actually write a report, your beacon was heard here at this time uh, with this signal string. So if you got the urge to beacon, you can try it on, on 10 meters. More rules. When can you transmit music? The only time you can transmit music on the ham radio bands is when it's incidental to a manned space flight. If some stations are given authorization by NASA to rebroadcast the Earth to, to um, aircraft um, transmissions, and if you have this auth authorization from NASA, remember they used to wake up the astronauts by playing them music. You could rebroadcast the music. That's the only time that music is allowed to be broadcast on the ham bands. Now, if you're traveling down the road and you got your radio on, which I did this evening, and you key up and music is heard in the background, that's probably considered incidental use and you wouldn't be cited for it. But if you broadcast you know, directly, well, then you're gonna have a problem. Speaking of broadcast, can you as an amateur radio operator a broadcast? In this case, it's considered a one-way transmission. Well, the only time you're authorized, you are authorized to do this for Morse code practice. So if you want to put together a, a practice session for Morse code, you could transmit it out for others to use uh, to, to practice their Morse code. Uh, the W1AW station from the ARRL in Newington, Connecticut, transmits a regular series of Morse code broadcasts for practice. Uh, and that's, this is the authority that they use. Yeah. Was this the same rule that allows you to rebroadcast weather on, on an irregular basis? That's coming up. Okay. That's coming up. Different, different rule? When can you retransmit a broadcast when it's weather forecast information or propagation information intended for use by the general public, number one, and originated from a US government facility? So in this case, a weather map that maybe was downloaded from a US government weather satellite. You could rebroadcast on slow scan TV. That would be authorized. That's the only time. 
secret codes. Can you use secret codes? Yes, in two specific occasions. If you're controlling a model aircraft or drone or something like that, you don't want somebody else to take over control of that. So it is possible for you to use a secret protocol to communicate with remotely controlled vehicles. The other is if you're communicating to a satellite, an amateur satellite in space, uh, you're the control station, you don't want everybody to be able to control that satellite, so you may use ciphers in that regard. Those are the only two exceptions. Well, QSO, QRM, QRN, those are Q codes, aren't those codes? Their meaning is widely known, and so therefore they're considered procedural signals, not codes. You can use codes as long as they don't obscure the meaning of a message. As, so if there's a popular code in, you know, see you L, see you later, used in Morse code, also used in text messages now. It's, it's commonly known that see you L means see you later. You could do that. QRP, everybody remember what QRP means? The RP, reduced power. So anything under five watts is generally considered QRP. Very nice Elecraft QRP radio up here in the front. Remember from the technician class, this ancient word from the 1934 Communications Act, pecuniary. You can't make money from your hobby uh, on the air. You can't uh, send messages for hire. Um, however, there is an exception. You can sell amateur radio equipment um, on the air. Uh, you can tell somebody about something you have for sale, or there are the, the swap and shops like on Wednesday nights. Uh, on the Caesar's Head repeater, that is authorized. So you could sell your $13,000 ICOM uh, IC 5851 on the air if you desired, 7851. Third party traffic. So here we have two guys that are sitting in the ham shack. One is the control operator. The other person sitting there is a third party. The, the, the second party is the guy at the far end of the radio link. So first, second, third party. Can you send a message from a third party over amateur radio? The general answer is no, unless there's a third party agreement. Uh, and the latest list of third party agreements uh, is available from the ARRL. If you just Google ARRL third party agreements, you'll get the web page. And this is only part of the list of countries that allow third party traffic to be sent. Interestingly enough, Germany is not one of them. Um, and what, this goes back to the old posts and telecommunications days, long distance telephone, international phone calls that you know, cost you, uh, you know, a lot of money. Well, now the internet has superseded all of this, and it really doesn't make all that much sense. But it's still in regulation. So you have to have a third party agreement before you can carry a message. And third party messages must generally be messages relating to amateur radio, or remarks of a personal character, or messages related to emergencies or disaster relief. Again, you can't talk business on the handbands. So here's a special case. You have a former ham whose license was revoked in his home country. He comes to you and asks you to contact his brother who is a licensed ham and then um, pass a message to him. Even if we have a third party agreement, can you do that? The answer is no. If a ham has had a license revoked then they can no longer participate in amateur radio, even via third party traffic. So what if it was your brother? He had the message to send and his license was revoked. Doesn't matter. If somebody is revoked from amateur radio, they're out. Forever you can get it back in that 
Depends on the if they could get their license back, then then they could you know then participate again. Possible to get it back. I don't know of any cases where it's been done. Okay. Possibly if they pay fines and whatnot, maybe they could, yeah. So if you'd like to put a radio repeater on the air, you, you like that Caesar's head repeater and you might want to put your own on the air, well, you can do that and you can listen and say, okay, I think that frequency over there is, is free. I'm going to use that frequency pair and put my repeater up. You can do that. However, if you do it just like that, you are what is known as an uncoordinated repeater. You haven't talked to anybody else. It's not you know, in sync with any band plans or anything else. And if you cause interference to somebody else, you have to go off the air. It's not hard, however, to coordinate a repeater. And for this area, it's the Southeast Repeater um, Association, I can remember what the A stood for, um, who does this. And so here's a, a web link to them. Uh, so if you do have the, the thought of putting a repeater up, you can do it. Uh, just coordinate it with uh, Sarah in our case. A lot of radios uh, will do cross-band repeating. That's a, a, another kind of repeater. So and you can do that, no problem. Here's a, the case, though, if somebody who's put up, remember we talked about 10-meter band repeaters? Well, somebody's put up a 10 meter band repeater and they have an input to it on two meters. Well, can a technician operator go into that two meter uh, and come out on 10 meters? And the answer is yes. If the 10 meter repeater operator, control operator, has a general class license. That control operator's gotta be right next to the other guy. No, because repeaters can be operated under automatic control. So you can, a repeater has a control operator, always has a control operator, they just don't have to be on site. They don't have to be there. So if the control operator of the 10 meter repeater has a general class or above license, then a technician can work through it if they're only transmitting, the tech is only transmitting on two meters. It's, it, just be aware of that. All right, we talked about being secondary users I, I knew this was going to happen one day. Telemarketer, what do you think I'm going to do? <sharp inhale> Enough of that. Um, when hams are secondary users on a band, like we talked about 30 meters and 60 meters, you really uh, have to protect the primary users from interference. Another case when you have to protect um, uh, from interference is if you happen to be within one mile of an FCC monitoring station, and they do have them around the world um, and in the United States, or if you're operating using spread spectrum transmissions. We'll talk more about that. There are three answers here. What do you think this refers to? Um, special situations regarding harmful interference when hams are secondary users, when you're operating within one mile of an FCC monitoring station, or when you're using spread spectrum. That's an all of the above. All of those require taking special steps to avoid harmful interference. Here are the FCC monitoring stations in the United States. The nearest one to us is in Georgia, Powder Springs, Georgia. So if you happen to be driving through there, and get within one mile of the FCC monitoring station, you may have to cease transmission. Anybody know what this is? That's a Wi-Fi router or a Wi-Fi access point. Why would I bring that into an amateur radio class? Well, interestingly enough, the 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi band overlaps an amateur radio band. There's some interesting possibilities here. Um, the, the, if you look on the, uh, the band chart in the fine print, uh, the region between 2,390 megahertz to 2,450 megahertz is an amateur radio band. And channels one through eight in the Wi-Fi scheme in the United States are generally within that ham band, that amateur radio band. Um, and remember that Wi-Fi uh, is a spread spectrum type of transmission. On the top, 
you've got a non-spread spectrum. So if you're transmitting in the red there and interference comes in with the blue, well, the blue is gonna wipe you out and you're not gonna get a signal through. But with the spread spectrum, if there's interference, at least some of the information gets through. And in digital data with forward error correction, it might be enough to get everything you need through. So that's another look at spread spectrum. So here's an overview of the uh, 11 channels uh, that you're given. Um, when you can set up your Wi-Fi router, you can, you can pick a channel. But if you look closely, you realize that they all overlap, or a lot of them overlap. So if you're setting up your Wi-Fi router, here's an interesting factoid. There are three channels that you can use to avoid interference. Channel one, channel six, and channel 11. And that will give you the maximum um, uh, protection from interference. And remember, you'll get this as a PDF, so you'll, you'll see this. So 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi, it's a spread spectrum signal. The output power in the routers varies by country. So in Europe, if I buy a Wi-Fi router, you're limited to 100 milliwatts. In America, you're limited to 1,000 milliwatts. And how many watts is 1,000 milliwatts? One. 1,000 milliwatts is one. So if I bring my American Wi-Fi router and operate it in Europe, I'm a pirate because <laughs> I'm operating with 10 times more strength than they're allowed. Okay, what if you're an amateur radio operator in the United States? We are allowed for spread spectrum transmissions up to 10 watts. I can use that right now. So you can soup up your Wi-Fi router to instead of operating with one watt, operate with 10 watts. And hams have done this by loading special software into the routers and adding RF power amplifiers and whatnot. And they have created, one of the terms is ham mesh, uh, the other wide area networks with out external antennas. So they're, they're transmitting Wi-Fi signals you know, 20, 30 miles from mountaintop to mountaintop and providing data links over ham radio Wi-Fi using commercial routers. A neat facet of the hobby. So the 2.4 gigahertz area that we're talking about is known as the 13 centimeter band. That's a ham band. Uh, we share it with unlicensed devices. Uh, there are primary and secondary users. And can we communicate with just conventional Wi-Fi routers from our ham routers? The answer is no. Um, because it's a shared service. So you can go ham to ham, but you can't go ham to somebody's house. So just keep that in mind. At the moment, there are no banned countries that we cannot operate and, and work um, as amateur radio operators. There have been in the past, but there are none now. Now, North Korea, um, we could talk to North Korean hams if there were any, but there aren't any. Um, and that's probably the most wanted country right now for DXers and, and contesters. Um, there are alarms set on systems so that if a P5, which is the prefix for North Korea, you can see it on the back of the ICOM chart there, um, if a P5 ever comes on the air, Alarms will go off all over the world, and amateur radio operators will rush to their ham shacks to tune on that frequency to find out, is it real? And that, there have been people who have falsely put up you know, reports that are P5. But, uh, there was one Polish ham, Dom, Dominic, you don't always call off the top of my head, who got special permission to demonstrate amateur radio in North Korea for one hour. And he had officials all around him. He was only able to operate 100 watts voice, single sideband. He made 200 contacts. He made, he made 200 people very, very happy. Um, but if a country wishes to 
ban amateur radio, they formally notify the ITU saying we wish to have no amateur radio communications from our country, and then that's transmitted out. But at the moment, for the United States, there are no banned countries. But there are countries that have no amateur radio operators, North Korea and Yemen, for example. All right, let's answer some questions. On which HF or medium frequency band? No, no, no ham radio operators? Yemen at the moment, no. I've talked to Yemen before. Not now. Since when? Last five years since I've been teaching? Unless, unless they're newly on. So anyway. Okay, it's been over five years. Yeah. So, okay. On which HF medium frequency bands is a general class license holder granted all amateur frequency privileges? So remember I said it was all of the bands except the old timers bands. And 15 meters is an old timers band, so it is C. You get a lot of bands, but you don't get the old timers bands. So you, if you can remember the, those, then you can look for them. And, okay. On which of the following bands is phone operation prohibited? Remember that was that special data only 30 meters. And on which of the following bands is image transmission prohibited? Image meaning slow scan television. Slow scan television is a voice mode. So again, 30 meters. Which of the following amateur bands is restricted to communication only on specific channels? That's 60 meters, correct, the five megahertz. And on which of the following frequencies, which of the following frequencies is in the general class portion of the 40 meter band in ITU region two? 40 meter band. So 40 meter band are approximately what frequencies? Seven megahertz. So already you can drop two of those right out. The C and D are 40 megahertz. They're not in the, in the 40 meter band. So, so which of those? So the top end of the 40 meter band, if you look at your chart, what's the top end? 7300. So it couldn't be 7.5. So it's got to be by process of elimination, 7.25. Can we take these into the test? No. <laughs> Which of the following frequencies is within the general class portion of the 75 meter phone band? And in, if you look at the charts, you'll see that the general class is generally given for the phone, the, the upper portion of the band. So that, that's, a, that's a clue. What's the top end of the 75 meter, 80 meter phone band? Top end is at four megahertz. So C3900 kilohertz is the right answer. Is it some kind of key or some kind of trick to learn? Well, if you can't remember, if you can't remember, remember that formula 300? Yeah. yeah. And you can use that. Um, but it isn't always right. Well, it's not, it, it's a, it is right. It is always right. It's the amateur way that we talk about bands that's wrong. Okay. So, yeah, if, if you uh, take 20 meters, for example, and you divide that into 300, you're going to get 15. Well, we, we can't transmit on 15 megahertz. It's close to 14 megahertz. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's an imperfect imperf science here. But, yeah. but, but actually, the wavelength of the, of the radio wave, 300 divided by the frequency in megahertz, is exactly right. And that's how build, big you build your antenna. Which of the following frequencies is within the general class portion of the 20 meter phone band? I hear C. Do we agree? It's C. Because the top end of the band is at 14,350, so 14,405 wouldn't work. 
14005, that's in the CW portion of the band. So, yep, 14305, because it's in the top end of the band, remember, for the general class. And who lives in the low end of the phone band where the extras and the advanced people can work? That's where the DX lives. So that's why you want to upgrade to extra, so you can talk to all the, the DX stations. Some DX stations will purposely operate there so that they don't have as big a pileup. It filters the riffraff, exactly. <laughs> Which of the following frequencies is within the general class portion of the 80 meter band? Now, read this carefully. Which of the following frequencies is within the general class portion of the 80 meter band? Did they say anything about the phone portion? No, they might be talking about Morse code. So if you look on your chart, 3560 is in the general class portion of the 80 meter band, but it's in the CW. All right, which of the following frequencies is within the general class portion of the 15 meter band? So 15 meters is what frequency range? 21 megahertz. So already you can drop two of those right out. Actually, you can drop three of those right out. There is only one 21 megahertz. Don't have my glasses on. And which of the following frequencies is available to a control operator holding a general class license? So what band are these in? 10 meters, all right. All of those are correct. And when general class licensees are not permitted to use the entire voice portion of a band, which portion of the voice segment is generally available to them? The upper frequency end, yes. And which of the following applies when the FCC rules designate the amateur service as a secondary user? They must not cause harmful interference to the primary users. And what is the appropriate action if when operating on either the 30 or 60 meter bands, a station in the primary service interferes with your contact? Suck it up, buttercup. Move to a clear frequency or stop transmitting. You are a secondary user. And what portion of the 10 meter band is available for repeater use? The very top end, the end above 29.5 megahertz. And with which of the following conditions must beacon stations comply? I didn't specifically mention, but you got it, D. There must be no more than one beacon signal transmitting in the same band from the same station location. And which of the following is a purpose of a beacon station as identified by the FCC rules? Propagation and reception observation, yep. And which, uh, which of the following transmissions is permitted? You can retransmit those weather maps or other propagation information if it comes from a US government station and it's intended for the public. Which of the following one-way transmissions are permitted? Those intended to help you learn international Morse code. And what are the restrictions on the use of abbreviations or procedural signals in the amateur service? The general rule is they may be used as long as they don't obscure the meaning. 
on what high frequency frequencies are automatically controlled beacons permitted? Here we're, they're referring to you as an amateur radio operator. The only place that you, without special authorization, can operate a beacon station is on the 10 meter band. And what is the power limit for beacon stations? 100 watts peak envelope power. And when is it permissible to communicate with amateur stations in countries outside the areas administered by the FCC? You can contact any other amateur station as long as their government has not filed with the ITU to say that it's, it's prohibited. Say that again. You can talk to any amateur radio station from any other country, right now, any country, as long as their government hasn't formally filed with the International Telecommunications Union that um, amateur radio service in this country is prohibited. So they don't have to be a member of ITU in order to file? No. Although most of them are. Most all are. Because it makes sense to coordinate frequencies. So which of the following would disqualify a third party from participating in uh, stating a message over an amateur station? <coughs> the third party's amateur license has been revoked and not reinstated. And when may a 10 meter repeater retransmit the 2 meter signal from a station that has a technician class control operator? The 2 meter station has a technician class operator, but the repeater control operator holds at least a general class license. Which of the following conditions require a licensed amateur radio operator to take specific steps to avoid harmful interference. This is that all of the above one, all three of those. And what types of messages for a third party in another country may be transmitted by an amateur station? No. C. Only messages related to amateur radio or remarks, remarks of a personal character or emergency traffic or disaster relief. In what part of the 13 centimeter band may an amateur station communicate with non-licensed Wi-Fi stations? No part. You can communicate with other amateur stations, but you can't communicate with non-licensed Wi-Fi. And why should an amateur operator normally avoid transmitting on 14.100, 18.110? You can read the rest. What do you think? That's where the beacons live on those frequencies. So you don't want to, you know, interfere with the beacons. And now what band do amateurs share channels with the unlicensed Wi-Fi service? 2.4 gigahertz or 13 centimeters. All right, last section, technical rules and standards. So two things that amateur stations must generally abide by are good operating practice and good engineering practice. And who sets those standards? And I'm going to tell you, it's not you. It's the FCC. So you must abide by their decision. Is that good engineering practice or is that good operating practice? Um, and one good practice as set forth by the FCC is always, always to use the minimum power necessary uh, to carry out a desired communication. So if you can get from point A to point B reliably with 10 watts, you don't need to transmit with 1,500. Use the least power necessary 
to do the job. Did you ever get cited because you did follow that? Possibly, but I would doubt it. It's, it's real hard to measure. No, it actually it isn't. You could, the field strength relative to a standard, you could. Right, well, over over a distance, it gets it gets more difficult. Yeah, but yeah. Very few people use that rule. Yeah. So maximum power output on the amateur radio bands, uh, not all of them, but on the majority of them, is considered to be 1,500 watts peak envelope power. That is what we call the legal limit in the United States. The legal limit in Germany, for example, is 750 watts. The legal limit in Great Britain is 400 watts. So we have it good. Um, and to get to this power level, you must use an amplifier to take the, the signal coming from a 100 watt or 200 watt radio and amplify it up to this legal limit. And as an aside, there are different ways you can measure the duty cycle of an amplifier. Um, and the really beefy amplifiers are what they call continuous commercial service amplifiers. This is an old ad. I don't know if you can see. There's a brick that is sitting on top of a Morse code key. This was an ad for alpha amplifiers. And you can still buy alpha amplifiers. But they'd come to ham fests with their amplifiers, uh, hook them into big dummy loads, and do this exact thing. When they opened, they put the brick on the key, and they let it run for the entire ham fest. That was a continuous commercial service amplifier. It could take it all the time. In amateur radio service, they use something called ICAS, or intermittent commercial and amateur service. Intermittent commercial, amateur service, that's a 50% duty cycle. They expect it to be transmitting for maybe five minutes, then you have to let it rest for five minutes. Most of the amplifiers you buy nowadays are ICAS rated. And there's a link there at the bottom with more information about this. We already talked about the exceptions to this. 60 meters, you're limited to a maximum of 100 watts to a dipole antenna. 30 meters, the maximum is 200 watts. And we say peak envelope power. Peak envelope power is a reference to some form of amplitude modulation. Single sideband or AM uh, are measured in peak envelope power. And how you do it is you um, measure the peak to peak voltage going to a load or to an antenna. You divide it by two to get to just the peak voltage. Then you multiply by 0 0.707 to get the equivalent RMS or DC heating voltage. Then you uh, um, square that, and then you divide by the characteristic, characteristic impedance of the load, 50 ohms. That's how you get to 1,500 watts. You'll learn more about this in the extra class, but this is the formula, and Dave's going to be talking a little bit more about this as well. This is just to give you your first glimpse at peak envelope power. Digital communications. This is the thing right now, since we're at the bottom of the sunspot cycle. Um, making voice contacts is, is difficult. Making Morse code contacts can even be difficult. But digital communications, um, some of the new modes can listen into the noise and actually hear signals that you can't. You can't perceive them with your ear, but the computer can. Um, and so when using digital communications on the high frequency bands, um, there's something called symbol rate versus bandwidth. And the symbol rate is measured in baud. And on all of the high frequency bands below 10 meters, you're limited to 300 baud. Does anybody remember 300 baud telephone modems? That's, e that's exactly what we're talking about. So below 10 meter frequencies, 300 baud is the maximum symbol rate uh, that you can use. 10 meters is the dividing line. And at 10 meters, you can jump up to the big 1,200 baud. 
Um, six meters and two meters, you can go to 19.6. 70 centimeters, you can go to 56K, and above that, there is no limit. So these are some numbers that, unfortunately, you're going to have to memorize. I don't have any easy tricks uh, for you to be able to remember that. So the latest digital modes that are in amateur radio use are something called FT8 and now FT4. And the principals are Joe Taylor, Steve Frank, and Bill Somerville. Uh, and here's a picture of two of the three guys anyway. Um, there's a link here that can give you all of the information about uh, the software. Uh, the software is called WSJT, Weak Signal Joe Taylor is what it stands for. Um, and it was originally used for meteor scatter communications on VHF frequencies. Um, and in fact, here's an article um, from December of 2001 about this new software. Well, the software has been revised and updated with additional protocols added. Um, and now you can download it uh, from Princeton University, uh, which is where Joe Taylor works. Um, and it's free. Uh, and it um, works with on your uh, Windows computer, your um, Apple computer, on a Linux computer. There are lots of different flavors. It's updated frequently. Yes? Uh, is sometimes those software programs work better on one operating system than the other? Is that the case here? They Not that I'm aware of. Yeah, I think so. they all work pretty much the same. Um, and what this does is this is not a rag chew mode of software. You can't type in a message to somebody else. This is strictly for making what is considered a, a contact um, with another station. Yes, they heard you. Yes, you hear them. Yes, it's confirmed. Goodbye. That's essentially what a contact is in FT8 or FT4 using the software. But with just very modest stations with 100 watts and a vertical antenna, you can start talking around the world or making contacts with stations around the world. This is a big debate among ham radio operators now. It's not real ham radio. But even old timers like me have come over to the dark side and started making FT8 and FT4 contacts. So, if you were considering making your own software, here's some things that you need to think about. You should write down the new mode and the standards that are to be used. You need to document the technical characteristics of this new mode. You should enable peer review and comment and then strive for continued improvement. And Joe Taylor and Steve Frank have done that with the WSJT uh, software. But this is just something to consider. And FT4 is the latest flavor of this, um, and it's going to be used for contesting. Um, CQ Worldwide just had their first digital contest worldwide, uh, and FT4 was, was used in that. So questions? Last section, and then we're done. Who or what determines good engineering and good amateur practice? The FCC. And what is the maximum transmitting power an amateur station may use on 10.140 megahertz? That's the 30 meter band, so it's 200 watts. And what is the maximum transmitting power an amateur station may use on the 12 meter band? Well, the 12 meter band is not 30 meters, it's not 60 meters, so What's the maximum power you can use? 1,500 watts peak envelope power. <coughs> and what is the maximum bandwidth permitted by FCC rules for stations transmitting on upper sideband frequencies in the 60 meter band? Six, if you look closely in the fine print for the 60 meter band, it'll tell you it's 2.8 kilohertz. And this also, I just mentioned as an aside, this is the exception to the rule. There's always an exception. Remember, we, we told you last week that below 9 megahertz, you always use lower sideband, except here. 
this is you know, 60 meters, it's 5 megahertz, it's below 9 megahertz, but if you read the fine print, you have to use upper sideband because it's a shared service. So which of the following limitations apply to transmitter power on every amateur band? A good operating practice is that only the minimum power necessary to carry out the desired communications should be used. And what is the limit for transmitter power on the 28 megahertz band? It's not 30 meters, it's not 60 meters, so 1,500 watts PEP. And what is the limit for transmitter power on the 1.8 megahertz band, also known as 160 meters, which is just above the AM broadcast band? What's the maximum power? 1,500 watts PEP, and you're going to need every one of them because that's a hard band to propagate on without power. And what is the maximum symbol rate permitted for radio teletype or data in the 20 meter band? Remember the first telephone modems? 300 baud. And what is the maximum symbol rate permitted for RTTY or data at frequencies below 28 megahertz? Asking the question in the same way, or a different way, I mean 300 baud. Below 10 meters, below 28 megahertz, on any band, it's 300 baud. And the maximum symbol rate permitted on the 1.25 and 70 centimeter bands. Again, you're going to have to kind of memorize this. It's 56K. And for 10 meters, that's where the dividing line is. So it's not 300 baud anymore. You get the big 1,200 baud on 10 meters. And 2 meters, well, that's up another notch. That's 19.6. So just a little bit of memorization is going to have to happen. OK. So what must be done before using a new digital protocol on the air? What did Joe Taylor and Steve Frank have to do? They had to publicly document the technical characteristics of their FT8 and FT4 protocols. And the maximum power on 60 meters? Remember, it's 100 watts with respect to a dipole antenna. And what measurement is specified by FCC rules the regulate maximum power. We, you've heard it said a couple times tonight, peak envelope power, or PEP. And what is the maximum PEP output allowed for spread spectrum? We can do better than out of the box, 10 watts. And what is QRP operation? Low power. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of chapter three. I thank you very much. We'll see you next week.